application. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to start sharing here. And everybody who is in chat, by the way, to the people I know, I, I recognize some names here. Hello. If I don't recognize your name, uh, hello. Well, that way I don't have to tell you which ones I recognize and which ones I don't. I recognize all of you. You're all great chat. Speaking of which, if you have questions, uh, like Sean mentioned, you can raise your hand and we'll uh, let we'll see how we can do microphones or drop it in chat. I will have chat right in front of my eyes right here. I'm watching you chat. In the meantime, hello and welcome to data virtualization with Polybase. My name as mentioned is Kevin Fiesel. I'm a data platform MVP out of Durham, North Carolina, where I run a predictive analytics team. I also have a blog called Curated SQL, where each day I try to find five to 10 interesting posts on topics all across the data platform space and link to them for you. So check that out, curatedsql.com. I will note that my slides are actually over on this screen. So if I keep looking that way, it's not because I'm trying to avoid you, it's because I need my uh, slide inspiration. But what we're going to talk about today is Polybase. Polybase is Microsoft's technology for data virtualization and scaling out queries from SQL Server. We'll briefly cover installation and configuration, and then I wanna focus a lot on the process of how you work with the queries, how you work with the objects that are created, and implement some scenarios. So let's get started with that. And the first thing that I'm gonna mention is what this thing really is. So this is a fairly recent technology for uh, covering a few use cases. The first one is connections to heterogeneous remote data sources. What do I mean by that? Well, I wanna connect to a remote Hadoop cluster. That was the original use case for Polybase. I want to integrate SQL Server and Hadoop together on an appliance. It expanded out from there. Well, what if I want to connect instead to like Azure Blob Storage or maybe Oracle or Teradata or MongoDB or another SQL Server instance or a Spark cluster or whatever else? So being able to connect to those types of things. Then data virtualization, which is creating a layer on where you can imagine you have a SQL Server instance, you have an Oracle database, maybe you have a Teradata over here, and you just want to have it appear as though everything were just one system. So query it all from SQL Server, write in the same T-SQL language, join together tables regardless of the source, and uh, have the data still live on those remote sources. Finally, third concept, scale out versus scale up. And touching on the concepts of massive parallel processing with SQL Server. So I mentioned that the crux or the historical basis for this was trying to find a way to integrate SQL Server with Hadoop. This was started in 2010 in the heyday of uh, the Hadoop bubble. And there was a lot of interest from certain companies that, hey, we have these Hadoop clusters, we have these SQL Server instances, it would be really great if we could have these two data sources talk to one another. And the answer was Parallel Data Warehouse, an on-premises appliance that was extremely expensive. I never got to see one in person. I could not afford even to get the ticket to look at one in person. Uh, then this is renamed to APS, and it's still too expensive for me to think about. But in SQL Server 2016, Polybase was introduced on what I would consider normal SQL Server instances. So you did not need to buy this special, really expensive appliance. You could install SQL Server 2016 Enterprise Edition and be able to get access to some of the same functionality that was available in Parallel Data Warehouse. In 2019, there's a newer version of Polybase. And this includes integration to a number of other data sources, including Oracle, Teradata, MongoDB, and generally anything over ODBC. Polybase was also brought into SQL Server big data clusters. So that was another part of that uh, 2019 push where we're integrating Spark and SQL Server 
really closely and using polybase as part of that glue. With the initial version of polybase, there were two data sources supported. The first one was HDFS. Go read files from uh, Hadoop. Incidentally, Azure Blob Storage has a web HDFS interface. And so it was actually pretty easy to allow Polybase to connect to Azure Blob Storage as well. In 2019, we get a much broader variety of, of systems supported by Polybase. And here's a list, including other SQL Server instances. That actually is the one that was most appealing to me because I want to be able to connect these instances without necessarily going over linked servers for everything. Another concept I've been kind of excited about, and we're not there yet. Maybe someday we'll get there. But using SQL Server for scale out. The SQL Server is a classic scale up technology. And what I mean by that is I have a certain amount of resources, this much RAM, this much uh, CPU, this many cores of this level. We have disks of this nature. They've got this sort of latency. And if I want to improve performance, if I want to improve performance, then I've really got one option outside of like writing better code. And let's face it, we're not going to write better code. Um, so if I want to throw more hardware at the problem, uh, I'm, I'm being facetious there, please, please write better code. But we throw more hardware at the problem. And by that, I mean, well, I can add more RAM. If, if RAM is my bottleneck, I can add more. If disk is my bottleneck, I can swap out with faster, say, NVDIM or NVMe disks or uh, moving up to all flash arrays or something. If CPU is the problem, I may be able to get more expensive, faster processors or maybe more cores, depending on what my issue is. But there is a practical limit for all of these. There's a practical limit for how much RAM you can actually fit on a server. And if I want more RAM than that, I have to go to multiple machines and scale it out. There's nothing that stops you from scaling out on your own. And there are uh, quite a few companies that I've worked with and that I know of who have split out data across multiple instances that have sharded their data in a way that allows for multiple servers to handle pro uh, work independently. But this is a little bit different from the concept of Hadoop. The Hadoop is a massively parallel processing system. The whole idea is if I want more power, I add more servers and behind the scenes, a lot of the rebalancing work happens so that the growth rate is nearly linear. With something like SQL Server, that rebalancing can be an endeavor. A uh, company I work for, it's we spent years trying to come up with a regularly runnable strategy for moving customer data between servers because you're talking about thousands of tables across dozens of databases and in a multi-client system that especially one that can't go down uh, there's a lot of work involved there's a lot of effort involved in making sure that the moves are clean meanwhile with something like hadoop you know, a lot of that stuff is taken care of for you, and that's a major benefit of it. So scale up versus scale out. Uh, scale out is usually a lot cheaper than scale up because I can buy many uh, boxes of some quality for the same price as one box of n times that quality. So if I had, for example, say 50 relatively inexpensive machines, if you add up the summation of all of the RAM and CPU capabilities, I'm probably going to do better than one box that has 50 times the individual server's amount of, of resource capability. And scale up is going to hit a ceiling before scale out will. Scale out in practice, you can usually get uh, hundreds of servers communicating together. Thousands is in the one to 2,000 range is usually about the maximum size that you want a Hadoop cluster to be. 
LinkedIn stretched that out a bit further, but you're talking relatively exceptional cases for a single cluster. But still, I can have a thousand machines worth of hardware connected together that is going to absolutely dominate one machine. I, I can't have that much uh, resource power in one machine. But that comes at a cost. It is usually a lot more complex to deal with this. And there are entire software layers that are dedicated to trying to solve some of these problems. Even within the Hadoop ecosystem, you, know, you have the processing engines involved in Yarn for resource negotiation. You have Apache Mesos. Uh, you have other projects that have just been dedicated to trying to solve the problem of pro limiting resource contention while also making available the most resources for given problems. And the other thing that we typically see is that scale out usually has a longer startup time. If you think about a fast query, I want to look up one row from a table, that is going to always be faster on a single machine than it will in a distributed cluster because you have fewer points of indirection. So with a scale out solution, you kind of have to figure out, okay, which instance do I need to get that data from and then hit that uh, instance. And in a world which uses a uh, Hadoop or Spark or something else for clusters, there is a cost to starting up a job. A Hadoop job using MapReduce, minimum startup time is usually about 30 seconds, which means if I have a job that takes five seconds to run, that 30 second startup time is a lot. But in practice, we're talking about jobs that historically would take a day to run or six hours to run, at which point 30 seconds is not even uh, measurable. So given the scope of the type of problem they're dealing with, that startup time is a perfectly acceptable cost. For a transactional processing system where I need immediate lookups, that's not an acceptable cost. It's sort of just what is the need uh, and what are the capabilities of the systems at hand? So that's the concept. This is kind of giving you a level set of what we're in here for. When it comes to installing and configuring Polybase, it's actually pretty easy. We start new standalone or uh, add features to an existing installation. And I'm going to select this option here for Polybase query service for external data. This is what gives you what I'm calling Polybase V2. This is the connectors for SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, and uh, MongoDB. And it is also the ODBC connector. If you want to include Polybase V1, Hadoop, and Azure Blob Storage, check that box. If you check that box, you're going to need to install a little bit more to get the support. The next step is Right here, do I want to use Polybase as a standalone or as part of a scale out group? A standalone instance, what that means is I can only have one Polybase instance and it basically it's not going to uh, do anything massive or parallel. If I do want to connect together multiple servers running SQL Server, and have them try to solve some problems together, I can use scale out groups. Notice that I say servers, because this is not two named instances on the same machine. It is one installation of Polybase per machine, whether that's one VM or one physical box. So just because you have eight named instances, you still only get one installation of Polybase. Something to keep in mind. But if I have four VMs on a blade, uh, I could have four installations of Polybase. Incidentally, I would say if you are running this in a production environment, even if you don't scale out, even if it is just standalone, uh, I would still select scale out because if you want to switch, you have to uninstall the Polybase components and then reinstall them later. So it's a very important decision. If you do select Polybase V1, you have to install Java. And as of SQL Server 2019, there is an integration with Azul Systems Zulu OpenJDK, which is a supported version of Oracle's um, 
open Java development kit. Azul Systems provides the tech support. They have an arrangement with Microsoft. If you're a SQL Server customer and you have a problem that is related to uh, the Java components, then if when you work with Microsoft on a case, uh, they can bring in Azul Systems and that way you don't have to also purchase an Oracle support agreement. But you do need some form of Java installed for this to work if you're using the Polybase V1. V2, you do not need Java installed. So if you're not connecting to Hadoop or to Azure Blob Storage, then you don't need uh, Java. When you're done, you're going to get two new accounts. So two services, each of which by default uses the network service account. Polybase Engine, Polybase Data Movement Service. Think of the engine as the brains of the operation, the data movement service as the uh, the bulk of the operation. If you have a scale out group, you will only ever have one Polybase engine. You have one boss man, and each server will have its own data movement service. So they'll have workers on these other machines, but only one engine for bossing others around. Uh, so otherwise, this would be disabled for the uh, worker nodes on a scale out cluster. You may have to change the account names. If you're using a scale out group, you will need domain accounts. So you have to be on a, a Active Directory domain for that to work. You're ready to install. Go on next, 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 install, and hopefully everything succeeds. If it does, then you can pop open your SQL Server client of choice and run just a couple of small configuration scripts. One of them says, Yes, I would like to use Polybase. The other one is about Hadoop connectivity. If you have a Cloudera uh, CDP cluster, so CDH cluster, excuse me, CDH. Um, I had to think about that for a second because Cloudera merged with Hortonworks, uh, so the, the story's changed. So if you have an old CDH cluster on premises or in virtual machines, you would set Hadoop connectivity to six. If you have a Hortonworks uh, data platform distribution, set that to seven. If you have neither, but you want to use Azure Blob Storage, set it to seven. If you have the new CDP, Cloudera distribution, uh, the Cloudera data platform, as far as I'm aware, Polybase doesn't work with it. Uh, there is no on-premises CDP that's all cloud-based now for Cloudera ever since the two companies merged together. So they have their legacy platforms, which are still workable, and their new cloud data platform service, um, I don't think works directly with Polybase. I don't think uh, the, port, the ports are open to allow the support. Although I could be wrong, I have not, I've not even tried. Um, I don't have access to one of those clusters. So just keep that in mind. If you're using Azure Blob Storage, set it to seven. Then you probably want to install some drivers on your SQL Server instance. These drivers, as long as they're ODBC drivers, have a decent chance of working with Polybase. Uh, so for example, I may have the Hortonworks Hive driver for ODBC. And this way I can connect to a Hive cluster running on the Hortonworks uh, data platform, the Hortonworks distribution of, of uh, Hadoop. And I can access tables from Hive instead of accessing files from the Hadoop distributed file system. So install the driver, configure it in ODBC data sources, and set whatever you need to. Connect to the appropriate port, connect to the appropriate host name, usernames and passwords, set all that stuff up. And then you can use that data source later on when accessing the resource. So we've talked a bit about history. We've talked about installation. Let's talk about what you get once you've installed Polybase. And there are three building blocks to the story. External data sources, external file formats, and external tables. An external data source is really just a pointer that says, hey, I've got some data over there. It's in some system. This is an Oracle system, or this is a Teradata system. It's not 
on your, your SQL Server instance. And the data does not migrate to SQL Server. This is not an ETL solution. Instead, the data lives over there, and we just know that it exists. We create an external data source using the create external data source syntax. So you give it a name, and you say, what type is this? Um, type is specific to Polybase v1. So if I want to connect to, for example, this Hadoop cluster, I would say type equals Hadoop. Location is uh, HDFS clustering 8020. HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, that um, protocol tells Polybase, okay, you're connecting to a Hadoop cluster over HDFS, and it is accessible on port 8020. This is the uh, port that is open for HDFS, not for Web HDFS. So that is going to be a little bit different. And if you're using Yarn, here is where my resource manager is. If you want to run MapReduce jobs against a Hadoop cluster, then you'll need to set this. So I'll talk briefly about what are the two options when you're using Hadoop. It's a little different with other sources. So Hadoop is a bit special. But if you're working against Hadoop, you have two options available to you. You can either one, pull all of the data back from Hadoop into SQL Server and then process that data in SQL Server, or two, create a MapReduce job. So Java code that is shipped over to your Hadoop cluster, processed on your Hadoop cluster, the results are sent back to SQL Server, and whatever final processing happens over here before it comes back to the end user. Those are the two options available. But in order to create that MapReduce job, Polybase needs to know that you have Yarn set up. And that way it can send off the operations to run that job. Otherwise, you're going to only be able to pull all of the data back. If you're using Azure Blob Storage, that's your only option. Pull all of the data, bring it into your SQL Server, work from there. If you're using one of those V2 sources, you don't need a resource manager. Most of these don't have resource managers. But there is some capability for pushing down operations, for uh, having work be done on the remote instance, pulling back just the data that you need. But all that happens kind of behind the scenes and essentially for free. Hadoop's the only one where you have to do anything extra to set it up. So if I want to connect to another SQL Server instance, I can create database scoped credentials. That's where I can store my uh, usernames and passwords. For SQL Server, I need to use SQL authentication. And uh, so I can only connect via Polybase using SQL authentication. Can't use Active Directory authentication for uh, connectivity. In order to create that external data source, I need a location. I need uh, to determine whether I'm going to allow predicate pushdown, and I need to send in my credentials. So the location, the protocol now determines where you're going. With V1, you had that type equals Hadoop to say, hey, this is Hadoop versus something else. Well, here, they realized you don't really need both a protocol and a type. So they got rid of type. Pushdown almost always should be on. Uh, the only time that I could think of where it would make sense to be off is if there's a bug when trying to push down an operation. Otherwise, I would allow it to be on. Because the worst thing that happens is there is no push down, in which case you pull all the data over your side, do the processing there. Best case is you do push down and you have the source system, which is probably more optimized for that data, send you back just the data that you need. So there's not much loss in allowing for pushdown, excepting if there's a bug. Uh, finally, credentials. How am I going to access this source? If you don't need credentials, say it's a public Azure Blob storage, then you don't have to send anything. But for SQL Server instances, you probably don't have the guest account turned on, and so you'll want to send in credentials. Same thing with Spark. You, know, you would send in username and password. 
uh, we would specify here is the connection. Now there is no special Spark protocol. This is just using the generic ODBC driver. So I have ODBC and I'm going to connect to this Spark cluster. And I'm going to specifically use the Hortonworks Spark ODBC driver because in this example, I'm, I was connecting to a Hortonworks Data Platform 3 um, Hadoop cluster that was uh, using Spark, that had Spark installed and had Livy uh, set up so that I could connect to it on port 10,016. Host port database server node. There's a little bit of duplication with Spark. Um, I actually needed to have all of that duplication for this to work. So that's the data source. Where does my data live? The file format. What is the um, structure of that data? So an external file format is really only needed for V1. And SQL Server will support a few different file types. One is delimited files. I have comma separated values, semicolon, tab separated, whatever that separator is. I can use uh, ORC, I can use Parquet, and I can also use a format called RC file. RC file is strictly weaker than ORC and Parquet. I don't recommend using it, but if you have some older Hadoop cluster that is still outputting RC file because of some process that needs it for some reason, uh, you can read those with Polybase. For V2 data sources, everything is actually going over ODBC. So it's all database connectivity, which means you don't have file formats. If I want to create a file format, I say create external file format, and define what that format type is. Delimited text has the most capabilities, the most things you want to set up. The field terminator tells me this is comma separated values. The uh, type defaults, if I have, for example, uh, an integer, the type default for integer is zero. The type default for a Boolean is false. So I could turn this to true if I wanted to. Usually I probably set that to false rather than true. And that way uh, zero really means a zero. Otherwise, if you say don't use type defaults, it's gonna be a null if I don't have this value. String delimiters and encoding. Next. We have this ORC file format and Parquet file format is very similar. Both ORC and Parquet are uh, columnar data storage technologies for files. What this means is they are going to store data by column rather than a row at a time. So the limited files are row based. There's another format in Hadoop called Avro, which is row based. Those are really good if I want to write a row, read a row. What they're not good at is analytics, because with analytics, usually we're more interested in aggregating through a column. ORC and Parquet are storing data as columns and also taking advantage of the fact that within a column, usually you get a lot of duplication, a lot of repetition. And so you can compress for, uh, through a column much more effectively than you can usually compress on a row. We know this in SQL Server because we see column store indexes and the types of compression you can get in certain cases on that. That sim similar philosophy holds for ORC and Parquet. So I set my format and I have a data compression option. With both ORC and Parquet, you have two compression options. There's basically one that is a little bit faster and one that compresses a little bit more. And depending on the, the file format, uh, you'll see the, the two options. Finally, external tables. So an external table is the structure of the data itself where it lives on the remote data source. SQL Server is going to require structured data. Yeah, your data may be in Hadoop. You may have embraced that semi-structured mindset, but SQL Server needs structure. And what I mean by structure is you have to tell it, uh, here's my table, so my external table, here are the column names, the data types. I don't tell it, uh, I don't have to tell it null or is uh, not null, but I do have to define column names, data types, and they have to match up. If I don't have some of these columns, that's okay, they can be null. 
But if I have, uh, say, registration state is often an integer, and I say it's an int, but then it starts coming in as a varchar later on, that's going to be a failure. So I have to meet the rules of SQL Server when importing data into SQL Server. Now, I'm going to define this on my data source. So my Hadoop cluster. Uh, my location is in a folder in there in HDFS, polybased data slash NYC parking tickets orc. And I define a file format for it. That's our external file format. And we have this concept called rejection. So I'm, I'm going to breeze through rejection, but there's a fair amount to it. Basically, when you're pulling in data from those V1 sources, you can imagine if I tell you this is the structure and I have a row that doesn't meet the structure, we've got to do something. Something's got to break. And what happens is that row is rejected. If you have a certain number of rows rejected, then the query fails. So in my case here, I've set it to 5,000 rows that have failed. Once you have that number, uh, throw an error message, stop processing. Now, if you imagine I have 5 billion records and we get processed 4.999 billion rows and I just hit that 5,000th, what's going to happen is SQL Server will say, well, golly, that seems like it's a little too much for me. I'm done. And all of that work that, that happened is gone. So you may not want value in some cases. You may instead want percentage. A fail on 20% of rows. And there are rules in place that prevent it from, let's say, failing on just the first couple of rows. You're like, oh, your first three rows were bad, but then the next 10 million were fine. Well, after three rows, 100% failure rate. So you set the reject sample value to say, hang on, don't, don't even fail until you get at least this many rows, maybe 10,000, 20,000 rows. That way, I start having a realistic sample and don't have a few errors at the beginning foiling everything for me. But I will note that for V2 sources, you don't have to worry about that. There is no rejection value in V2 because the definition of this structure is sort of predefined. Meaning, if I'm connecting to an external SQL Server table, so let's say here I'm connecting to this server that I've called SQL Control. There's a database scratch and there's a parking violations local table. The external table's definition for these columns must be exactly the same as on that remote SQL Server instance. So if that thing is summons number varchar 50, it's coming over as summons number varchar 50. You could technically make it varchar 100 or 200. You can make it a larger number, but that's about all you can change. I can't change it to an int. I can't say summons no or fix summons no to summons number. It has to follow the definition of the metadata on the remote system. Same thing goes if I'm connecting to Oracle, to MongoDB, to Cosmos DB, to whatever else, you have to match the structure. One of the nice things is if you fail to match the structure, what'll happen is SQL Server throws a, what is actually a really helpful error message that says, hey, I was actually looking for a structure that looked like this, and you sent me something else. And it'll say, summons number varchar 50 comma plate id varchar 120 et cetera et cetera so you could just take that copy it paste it and you kind of have the structure of your table so that way you know what it's supposed to look like kind of makes you wonder wouldn't it be better if they just uh created the table if you just said create external table as a definition of this and you know let it pull in the metadata and solve it for you but we don't have that. You, you have to fill in your own metadata. So here it is connecting to a Spark cluster. Very similar structure. I have column names, I have data types, and I'm connecting to a table in a Spark cluster. So we've looked at some code, but let's get some demos. So first up, 
I want to make sure that Polybase is enabled. By the way, all of the code, all of the slides, all of the demos will be available to you afterwards. I'll give you a link at the end. And I want to enable Polybase. So configure Polybase enabled, set that to one, and connect, uh, Hadoop connectivity, value to seven. So we're gonna connect to my SQL Server instance. One thing I will point out as of uh, CU3 of SQL Server 2019, there's a bug in Polybase to where you can only use it if you're logged in with uh, SQL authentication. So you can't use Windows Active Directory authentication when you're working with Polybase. This is incredibly annoying, by it, mind you. But uh, something that I just have to live with until they fix it. So I've already got this set up. If you didn't have it set up, you would want to restart the SQL Server database engine, kind of get going. I also have a Scratch database, and I've set up a database master key that is some secure key. So we know it's very secure because it says so. Next, I want to try to connect to Azure Blob Storage. Uh, this is going to be a pretty easy one. I have database scope credentials for Azure Storage. And looks like I may not have my credentials. Oh, I do have credentials. I just have to go to the right database. So we're going to double check that right there and say, yeah, we have credentials. What are the credentials? Sorry, I can't tell you. But if you have your own credentials, you can send in your identity and your secret and create a database scope credential for that. Then Azure Population Blob. So I have an external data source, Azure NC Pop Blob, which is over on uh, CS Polybase Blob is the storage account. NC Pop is the container name. And that's going to be my remote uh, data source. So where does my data live? It's out there. I have a file format, CSVs, so comma separated file format. And I'm going to create an external table called North Carolina Population that is based off of Inside my NC pop container, I have a folder census and a file North Carolina population dot CSV. If I have at least five values, I'm going to reject the query and fail it. So let's run all of this. And do a quick check of this table. So North Carolina population should have 13,607 rows, which in fact it does. And this query, at this point, North Carolina population, uh, if I pop over here to the Scratch database, in Azure Data Studio, this actually works out better than Management Studio. Um, oh, I have to refresh. Go. Now I have four North Carolina populations. That's how dedicated I am to North Carolina's population. So we have this North Carolina population table. The only way you know it's polybase is the fact that this says external at the end. In Management Studio, there's a separate folder. So you have your regular tables, and up at the top, there is a folder that says uh, external tables, and you'd find them in there. But it has columns. It has a table definition. It looks just like a regular table. And as far as I, as a developer, am concerned, this is just a regular table. It's North Carolina population. So you saw me query it. Um, I can also say do filters. You know, what are the full town est population estimates for the year 2017? And I get back my results. I could uh, create other tables within SQL Server. So here's a table population center, just a regular table. City population center, again, regular tables. And I can join these tables together using the same T-SQL you know and either love or at least have grown somewhat fond of over the years. And I get back my results. So joining works just as you would expect. Um, aggregations work just as you would expect. Basically, you have the entire T-SQL namespace available to you. If you can do it with a regular table, when it comes to reading data, there's a pretty good chance you can do it with an external table. Special note on reading data. Writing data, a little bit different. 
Uh, when it comes to writing data, you cannot write to a V2 source. So you cannot write to SQL Server, to Oracle, to Teradata, to Mongo, to Spark. You can write to a V1 source, HDFS or Azure Blob Storage, as long as it is insert only, and uh, that's it. So you cannot update, you cannot delete, you can't truncate, you can't merge, you can insert. So that way you can say archive data. Last thing I'm going to show in this little section right here is connecting to Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is technically not supported in uh, Polybase, but MongoDB is. So if you create a Cosmos DB collection using the Mongo API, then you can query that from Polybase as though it were a MongoDB. So once again, I have my secure key. I'm going to create some database scope credentials for Cosmos DB. Uh, I've got a username and a password that I've already set up. I'm going to connect over the MongoDB protocol to CS Polybase 2, which is the account name for Cosmos, for my Cosmos account. Uh, connections, SSL equals true. That is a configuration connection that you must set for connecting to Cosmos DB. And use the credentials. And then I don't need to create an external file format because I'm going to query it as structured data. So I have this table, Volcano. Uh, it's actually a collection in Cosmos DB, and it's a fairly well-structured uh, collection, except that there's this weird thing with Volcano coordinates, where the Volcano coordinates are stored as an array, latitude and longitude stored as an array. So let's see what that looks like. It would help if I copied the whole script. Go. I'm creating the tables and I've got what looks like the same GUID twice. If I scroll over, that's because my coordinates are an array and what happens with arrays and polybase is that the array is exploded out. So, or in other words, it's it's um, uh, pivoted into multiple rows. So we have now two rows per volcano, one that includes the latitude, one that includes the longitude. Supposing that we didn't want that. Well, if we don't want the coordinates at all, I could say select distinct. And you know that'll give me my unique set of volcanoes. Uh, there are other ways to do this. I mean, I could use, for example, string ag to combine the latitude and longitude back into coordinates. Of course, I'd have to group everything that's not part of the latitude and longitude. So that way we have our info one time and we have these coordinates here. Or, do you one better, I can create a table that doesn't have a column and Polybase will just dutifully ignore that column. So Volcano 2, if I run this create script, I do not have the column for uh, Volcano coordinates. And if I query Volcano 2, just one row per volcano and no coordinates at all. So the query succeeded. I didn't need to specify all of the columns over there. All right, let's look at some other scripts. So this one is cold storage of data. And this is actually a scenario that uh, someone in chat asked me to do. So this is a special request. Writing through Polybase. If I want to write to Azure Blob Storage or to the Hadoop distributed file system, I need to have one other configuration setting. But before I get to that, Let's talk through the scenario. Let's say I have some data. This is a fire incidents in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I have a table here. This is a SQL Server table. It's got locations of every time the fire department shows up at an incident at a place. And that's not just building is on fire. You have power lines that are down. You have a person in distress. Uh, you have water problems. So any sort of 
of issue that the fire department may handle, then they're going to list this in their uh, table. This is public records, and I was able to grab a copy of it from a few years back. I'm going to put that into a table called fire incidents local. But let us suppose that we don't need all of those, uh, all that data. We really just want to have data for the last few years on premises on our SQL Server instance, because that's the stuff that everybody queries. But the older stuff, an auditor comes in every once in a while, or a public records request comes in every once in a while, and we have to uh, run, run a query to get that data. But it's not important that it be fast. So new data, got to be fast. Older data can be a lot slower if it's going to be cheaper that way. And what we're going to do if you've been in the industry for a while, you're going to recognize this pattern immediately because we stopped having to do it in 2005 with partitioning tables. I'm bringing it back. So let's talk about what we're going to do here. Uh, decrypt our master key and create an external data source, Azure Fire Incidents blob that goes to this CS Polybase blob and it's going to hit visits. Now, I think. I am going to need to open up Azure Storage Explorer and delete some folders. So let me do that right here. I've got to remember which storage account I have. I would do it on camera or on screen, except I don't want you seeing my storage accounts. I know you're all very trustworthy people, but who knows who knows who's going to watch it later. So let me pop in. OK, visits. And I'm going to delete all of these. All right. Hopefully, I didn't just mess myself up. Definitely words you want to hear during a demo. OK, so I've, I've created this external data source. And then I'm going to create some tables, one per year. So each year, fire incidents. I'm going to have a table. 2019 data. Uh, and I've got a constraint for dispatch date time. 2018 data with a constraint. Null data. There was actually some data that doesn't have a year. I don't know, probably just bad data, but I'm going to put it in here as well. I'm creating new tables for my current data. They currently have no data in them, it's just empty tables. Then we're going to start loading those tables from Fire Instance Local. So for years prior, so between 2008 and 2018, uh, I'm going to now create an external table pointing to Fire Incidents 2008, Fire Incidents 2009, Fire Incidents 2010, and etc. I'm going to store this in ORC file format and create that external table for each year located in fire incidents year 2008 2009 etc on blob storage in that format and because i'm writing this data i know it's clean data i should not have any errors so if i have one row that fails that re is rejected fail this thing so i'm going to run this and it'll take a few seconds Basically, what it's doing is creating a whole bunch of new external tables. Fire incidents, you can see 2008 through 2013 have been created. The rest of them are being created as we speak. And it's done. So what am I going to do? I'm going to load that data. Let's insert some data. I need to allow polybase export. So that is an advanced option that allow polybase export to one, and then that is going to allow you to insert data into Azure Blob Storage or HDFS. Then for each year, you know what, let me, let me run this query because it takes a little while. There we go. So for each year, I'm going to generate an insert operation. So do I have any data in that year? If not, insert into that table, select data from the table. 
and also handle null separately because it's special. Then I'm going to create some statistics on each of the external tables. Um, you can create statistics on external objects in Polybase. That gives the optimizer an idea of what the distribution is, just like for a regular table. There are some special rules around statistics in Polybase that we're not really going to have time to get into, but for the most part, they're going to behave the same as regular statistics. And let's see. Oh, looks like we've got some file, some uh, rows that have been written. So great. Now the last step where we're taking it back to 2005. We're going to take this fire instance local table and we're going to turn it into a view. A view that is the union all of each of those individual tables, specifically where the dispatch date time is between our constraint dates. So we're doing a partitioned view as a way of partitioning this table so that we can have some of the data live remotely and some of the data live locally. And nobody knows the difference. So let's query this data. If I'm looking at just say 2018 to 2019 data and I run an explain plan on this. Oh boy. This is where Azure Data Studio really lets me down. Their explain plans are terrible. But we're still going to see a scan of table 2018, scan of table 2019. I'm not hitting any external uh, tables. If I want to get data from the year 2017, I have to run this operation first so that I uh, open my master key so that it can connect. It can grab the credentials to go out to Azure Blob Storage and connect. And if I hit F5, I'll get my data back. If I hit Explain, I'm going to see remote query that reads data from that 2017. So I'm getting some stuff in 2018 for the month of January. That's why I scan this table. 2017, I scan this table. And it concatenates those two together, gives me back my results. So what I end up having is the combination of old data and new data. If I just need that 2017 data once a month and I'm willing for it to be slower, I will tell you Azure Blob Storage is going to be slower than your really fast SQL Server instances. If I'm okay with that, then the end result is that I can store my data in Azure Blob Storage. Uh, if I refresh here, let me... Drag over just enough to see. There we go. This is my set of ORC files for the year 2008. So I have this data stored in Azure Blob Storage, and I'm querying this data every time we filter where the year is 2008. And that'll allow me to read data from, write data to my uh, Azure Blob Storage, or if I'm using a Hadoop cluster, uh, right to that Hadoop cluster. And once I have the data written, once I have the external data sources, external tables created, all I've got to do is query that as though it were a regular table in SQL Server, with the only real difference being the term external and the fact that, frankly, it's going to be slower. Um, there will be costs to migrating data, migrating that data over. It is not going to be as fast as what you would expect on premises. If you're okay with that, you can uh, gain some major benefits from it. So that was the example of cold storage here, where I kind of walk through the assumptions of where it makes sense. I have some other approaches for ELT and uh, some more info on tuning and administration. But very briefly, let's talk about data virtualization, since I think that's the big thing around Polybase in SQL Server 2019. If you have data in several different source systems, the source systems could use totally different technologies. I may have some of my data in Oracle, some of it in Teradata, some of it in uh, SAP HANA, some of it in SQL Server, and I want to try to find a way to query all of these systems using one language instead of trying to remember what Terada uh, Teradata's dialect of SQL is and how that differs from PLSQL and from T-SQL. So 
I want to be able to combine them and performance is not a key consideration because if I have a filter on this table in Teradata and this data in Oracle, and it's kind of the combination of the two, there's no easy way to filter both of those sides uh, from SQL Server. And so what happens is the data all gets kind of pulled together in SQL Server and temp tables, and then they get joined and processed and handled. And that's part of why performance can be a lot slower because you've got more data movement, more data processing, unless you're very deliberate in the way you're querying this data. So if you wanna use it as it should be used, which is not even thinking about where the, the source of the data is, understand performance. If you need better performance, you can improve performance, but now you have to be hyper-focused on where the data is and how you get it. Uh, but let's say we're at that, I don't care about performance state, or uh, we don't have enough data to where performance really matters that much. And in order to do that, let's briefly look at data virtualization. So I have a procedure, get volcano data, that retrieves data from the volcanoes table. That's the same volcano table we looked at with Cosmos DB. And I'm going to try to execute from that volcano table. And I'm going to get back my results. So I see some data. And I say, I'd really love to combine this with some other data source. Um, I have here a semicolon delimited file format and a table called country data. Country data comes from uh, the CIA World Factbook, they release information on each country on an annual basis and has a lot of stuff about um, economic standards, population, a lot of different interesting variables. So I'm going to update the procedure to include some of that new information about the country in which this volcano is located or is nearest to. And that's going to be this second procedure call. So I have data over here and I have GDP and GDP per capita, other stuff. So that's two data sources. And then I say, I also have an Excel file that includes information on the types of volcanoes. So with Excel, there is a Microsoft Excel driver that's the access redistributable drivers that allows you to query um, from a location. Here's my source location where this file is. And I can create an external table volcano type. And it looks for the volcano types sheet on that Excel workbook. And if all works well, then I should be able to query volcano with country data with volcano type and get back information about the volcanoes, get information about uh, GDP and population of the countries that it's nearest in as well as over here, a description of what the volcano type is and what that means. So with all of that, we have multiple sources. And as a developer, I didn't care where that data came from. All I need to know is what is the name of the table? What are the attributes? What are the data types? How do I join them together? And I'm good to go. I'm going to skip past all the administration stuff for the purposes of time. But I, like I said, if you're interested, I'll give you the slides, I'll give you the demos, links to additional resources, because I think Polybase is a really interesting technology, a lot of useful business cases. Performance is something you'll have to be considerate of, but you want a SQL interface, especially T-SQL, and performance is not your top consideration, uh, give Polybase a go. If you do want slides, links, demos, additional information, all of that is at csmore.info slash on slash Polybase. I have an email address that I generally respond to. I have a Twitter account that I occasionally look at. Um, also, csmore.info, uh, I have a book on Polybase published by A-Press in 2020 called Polybase Revealed. So if you want to go really deep into Polybase, that was the first book published on the topic. So go give that a look. And with that, everybody, thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise. Back to you, Jean.